ladies and gentlemen, there is a saying that your decision today defines your tomorrow. So the creators and innovators of the past have traveled down this road and, and formed the society that we live in today as we face forward to the potential future that will materialize from the current industrial revolutions and how businesses operate, uh, we will get a sneak peek into tomorrow's business and how we can be prepared for it. Ladies and gentlemen, for the panel discussion, mapping out tomorrow's business. In our panel today, we have a stellar lineup of C-suites in businesses, two of which have weathered the test of time, while another was established and thrives in this digital reality. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to introduce you to Mr. Samba Bathili, the co-founder and chief executive officer of Selectra International of Mali, Mr. Tobias Pueze, the vice president of MasterCard Labs of Asia Pacific, Eba Bahagia, Dato Richard Curtis, Group Managing Director of Chaya Mata, Sarag Berhad, Malaysia. And also, would like to introduce you to Ms. Lisa Oak, Chief Executive Officer of Oak Media Singapore, who will be the session moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our panelists and moderator for the session Mapping Out Tomorrow's Business. Good afternoon, everyone. Hear me loud and clear. Good to see you all today. My name is Lisa, and um, I've worked as a journalist in Asia for about 20 years, and, and 20 years in the media, and I have to say this part of the world has always been incredibly dynamic, and it moves faster than the West and more developed economies like Canada, where I'm from, or the United States or Europe. Uh, things always seem to move at a much faster pace uh, over, over here. And the past five years have been absolutely amazing to watch because things are moving even faster uh, than before and the growth has been completely exponential. So as business leaders, as CEOs, as CTOs, CIOs, um, it's difficult to know what do you focus on if you're trying to do well in business, if you're trying to stay ahead of the curve or even stay up with what's happening out there in the world. Um, how, do you, how do you do it? How do you work out your, your five-year plan? Do you focus on technology? Do you focus on customer experience? Where is your attention best directed? And that's what we're here to do today. We're going to do a one-hour discussion about how to plan out um, the, the, the future of business and map your strategy for the next five to ten years. And we have a very diverse panel here. Uh, as you heard from the, uh, as you heard from the um, introductions a little bit earlier, uh, we're going to come at this from all different angles. We have Samba, who's into renewable energy uh, over in Africa. We've got Toby, who's uh, a payments expert expert from MasterCard, so he'll be giving his view on, on what you see out there. And of course, we've got Mr. Uh, Dato Richard Alexander John Curtis, uh, and he is also going to be talking about his perspective as a business leader in Malaysia, and he's going to be retiring very soon, so he'll be giving us some, uh, not from the board of directors, he's still going to be on the board, but retiring as CEO, and he's going to be giving us some insights as well. So let's get started, and um, why don't we start with you, Samba, and we'll do five minutes Tell us what you're seeing. I want each of you to weigh in and tell us what you're seeing from your desk, your perspective on doing business out there in the world. What are you focusing on going forward? Thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Mr. Samba Bachili. I'm the CEO of ADS, Africa Development Solution. Uh, that's the mother company of Solectra. Solectra is a company that I found it uh, a few years back with uh, two other partners. Sorry, sorry to interrupt Sam, but can you hear? Can, can you all hear okay? Yeah. All right, please go ahead. Okay. Selectra is a company that I founded a couple of years ago with two other African diaspora entrepreneurs. Uh, what we do at Selectra, we bring solar uh, system into rural area. So far, we have electrified more than 1,500 uh, area in Africa, over 17 country. It's so far as a local company, the biggest uh, uh, type of um, uh, project management company in within Africa. We uh, impact more than 10 million people because the average community is around 5,000 uh, people. If you multiply that by 1,500 uh, plus uh, community. It's what the, our goal was into 
the three years to impact one million people, we multiply that more than 10, 10, uh, uh, ten times. So Selectra, our approach, we, we do public-private partnership with local government. We hire local companies to uh, deploy the, the product and service. And then we give them innovative financing so they can pay a, a repayment schedule uh, at the time. So that's so far what we do with Selectra. But also with ADS, I'm also involved with uh, infrastructure projects. I have structured a lot of PPP company with European, Chinese company within Africa. We did road, hydro project. So far we did project more than $6 billion within uh, uh, more than 10 countries in Africa. Fiber optic with Huawei, with uh, uh, more than 18,000 kilometers of fiber optic. This is roughly what we do. So creative financing is uh, certainly going to be important going forward. Toby, weigh in and tell us what you're seeing from, from the payment side. You say uh, voice is the new interface. Absolutely, and I think when we really look at payments, um, I really want to tickle the mind of what payments really means, right? It's a value exchange between entities or consumers and merchants, but it goes really beyond a traditional credit card. It's uh, the payment rail between accounts, the payment rail um, in terms of digital wallets. And I think what we're really seeing is how the point of interaction is changing, just how everything else around us is changing. We move from um, mobile, uh, browsers to mobile to now new interfaces that are more Internet of Things connected, that are voice-based. Uh, we're looking also in terms of the payment technology becoming much more quickly enabled. Um, so this is when we look at uh, fast account-to-account -account transfers in PromPay, for example, in Thailand that we are supporting via our Vocalink so, um, solution where you can instantly send money to an entity. So when you work in invoicing and smart contracts, um, when you think about your supply chain, a lot of these things have not been very transparent, they have not been very fast. How do we make sure that we bring in payment technology to create transparency, to create accountability, to create a ease of doing business and really using technology as a way of enabling those type of environments in terms of rails? And then last but not least, also about security. Because as the, everything starts to move faster, uh, you definitely have to um, take a step back in terms of how do you protect your overall ecosystem uh, from fraud, from uh, um, at, um, cyber attacks. Uh, I think some of you may have read about Uber just losing some 60 million email addresses and uh, phone numbers and they covered it up for almost a year. Uh, luckily, no financial information disclosed, but these are, um, these are big topics for all of us in terms of like how, as we are digitizing our businesses, how do we protect our digital identity? How do we uh, protect our entity and the business risk associated with the tax? And then how do we still retain interoperability? Because we can start building a lot of national or closed loop systems, but that's also gonna narrow us in terms of the business opportunity and potential growth that we can unlock. And so we're really in this business of creating interoperability across interfaces for businesses, governments, merchants, consumers, and really having a strong use case focus, making sure that uh, all of the technology is becoming fast, convenient, real time, and then of course, um, making sure that it's always safe and secure whenever you transact. <coughs> So you have to be fast, and you have to make sure that, that every transaction is completely secure. It's, it's not, an easy, uh, not an easy thing to do. Um, Richard, I want you to weigh in on this. Um, you guys started out as Sarawak's first cement manufacturer, and now you're a leading public company. You know a thing or two about plotting out a strategy and, and staying relevant. Okay. Uh, um, we, we basically have two focuses. We're primary manufacturing, like cement, smelting, but we also do infrastructure-related services like road maintenance, telco tower maintenance, and things like that. So we come from a very um, dinosaur background in a way. So all this mapping out of tomorrow's business, we've obviously been thinking about it. And my personal view is that the changes will be a lot less dramatic for people like us than we all think. You see, it's all happened before. They were all upset when you had the printing press. You're all upset when you had the Industrial Revolution. We all got upset in the 60s with automation. I think we've got a very good chance as companies. Now, I'm not talking about workforce. I'm talking about companies and business entities. 
We can all survive this change. The idea of facing, getting, being presented with a major disruption, like happened to say Kodak or Nokia, I don't think it's going to happen to most of us. What is going to happen is we're going to have to compromise and live with these new entrants, like Hilton and Marriott are living with Airbnb. So we're all going to learn to live with these new entrants. We're just going to have to adapt our business model. But the bigger issue to me, from where I sit, is that big companies learn and know about this new technology and new ideas. But what they don't have is the decisiveness and the leadership courage to address that challenge, face up to that challenge, and either steer away or take ownership of it. Nokia, remember, they knew all about smartphones. They had an app store. And look what happened. They missed the boat. Kodak knew about digital. And what do they do? Missed the boat. So you've got to take that take grip of these opportunities and do this research. And the problem is, to do that, middle managers will say, oh, well, let's form a committee and look at it. It doesn't work like that. You, you're at the boss at the top. You've got to go out and say, here's my money. I'm instructing that person to do this disruption, understanding about a new option. And it only comes from the top. Look at the guys um, from American Airlines. Travelocity and Kayak all came because that CEO believed he had to look at disruptive changes. Now, we have to do that, and most of us don't do that. So you need to have a vision. You've got to look ahead and take some small, medium-sized gambles. Don't just study it. Nokia studied the smartphone for ages and lost the plot. So we've got to be on top of that, and it comes from the top, not from middle management. Although it will pay you to listen to those young millennials you've got in your office and any disruptive, discordant managers. And also, don't be obsessed by big data. You still got to follow your intuition. Big data's got knowledge, but we as human beings can have wisdom. We can always get it right, but we're going to get further if we use our intuition and our wisdom. And the last thing is, when this new technology comes up, be aware of it, get ready for it. But you don't have to be the first guy to do it. Admittedly, in Strauch, I'm easy. I'm a cement manufacturer. I don't have to be cutting edge, because I can wait to see the big boys do it elsewhere. Then I will adopt. This is something we also need to remember. You don't have to be first, but you've got to be ready. And I just think, be on top of it, and we'll all be able to cope with this change. Mm, great points. Thanks to all of you. So, so from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the customer, despite all of the technology that's emerging, it still comes down to the customer and making the customer happy. And the companies that manage to disrupt existing business models are, are the ones who do something better. For, for the customer. Does, does that mean that your window to adopt new technologies or to respond, as you were saying, Richard, to respond to the, the challenges that are out yeah. there, does that mean that the window that companies have, it's much smaller these days because things are moving so quickly? It, it, it is, no, it's just moving faster. You, know, you need to bring a digital thread into your business. You need to look at sensors to monitor your machines. That's all common sense. Just get ahead and do it. Find the right solution and do it. And remember, you don't have to always be state of the art. You don't need to. Labor is reasonably affordable here. There's plenty of it. Don't panic. Human beings are great to have. Much nicer to talk to than a robot. And you need to get that marriage between machines and people. That's what we need. So we get the best of both worlds. Remember, we need workers because they are consumers. We cannot, cannot cut people out. Mm, um, Toby, jump in here and tell us from, from a payments perspective and a customer experience perspective. Um, you've got customers calling in. At what point do you stop using artificial intelligence and technology and put a live human being on the phone to talk to them? How do you, how do you know when to do that? Right, and I, and I think it really goes back to the evolution of the various economies. So when you think about, we started with supply economy. Supply economy is like no choice for the consumer. You've got to stand in line um, and kind of comply to whatever is being given to you. Then we move to our demand economy, which is more like segment driven. So let's say who's doing the best shampoo, who's doing the best motorbike, who has the bank be best banking services. And that kind of started to create product differentiation, um, people competing on features and benefits. I think what we're now seeing in digital is that we're moving into what we make coin as an expectation economy. So when we think about the artificial intelligence of a Spotify, which is a music streaming service where you, where actually construction-wise looks the same, like every app looks the same, but as soon as I hit that play button, it's gonna play EDM, and I'm sure Richard will have a different set of music playing. 
Um, so these are the, the kind of expectation that consumers no longer confine to just one industry. Like when they trans uh, basically transition from industry to industry, they kind of expect like banking to just work as easily as as um, Spotify in a digital economy. But imagine in the past, you would never compare a CD to a banking teller, right? So, so that's, I think, where the lines are blurring from an expectation standpoint and where we just need to be really focused. Um, and, the cons and the consumer will dictate when a human or a digital yeah. environment is really kind of the most appropriate to get the work done because it's all about helping solve jobs for businesses and consumers. And how do they do those jobs most effectively? And we look at it in customer service, where today we deploy most of our customer service staff at cashiers, which is not a particularly interesting and value-added service. Why wouldn't we want to put them more into customer service, where they can give you recommendations, tell you how good you look in your new clothing, or um, what is the latest um, ingredients for a recipe that you may <coughs> be interested in? Okay, okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, Samba, um, tell us what you're seeing when it comes to clean energy, um, solar solutions. Do you feel as much pressure as, say, traditional industries or banking payments? Um, do you, are you under as much pressure as these guys when it comes to, to staying current and, and keeping ahead of the curve? Yes. Um, first of all, when we came into the market, uh, there was a lot of proposal uh, with, which in Africa people was coming, trying to get to the market. But what we bring to the market that was disruptive, it was our approach. Because uh, what we've seen before, uh, people will come to African government and say, okay, here's our solution. They do a, a PPP or brochure, they give a brochure away, and they are expecting those governments to open LCs or payment term to pay them before to do the project. So we came in uh, because we know the local culture and everything. So we said, okay, here's the situation. Uh, show us a place where you want us to demo what we are capable of. So they show us a place. We put live a project. So from the village people, so the mayors, the deputies, the information come to the, to the city that we did it fast, it's working, and then it's impacting the people. So. Once that's done, we bring innovative finance because most of those governments, they have limited budget. I'll give you an example for a country that have, let's say, $10 million for uh, energy, renewable energy project every year. So in order to do a project that will impact the country, we could come and say, okay, we, we do a $50 million project. We electrify in one year. Uh, 200 places, and then we use uh, local people, uh, we involve them in the project because at that time people will be more uh, involved Absolutely. into the decision uh, of the project. So, and then those same people will maintain because before people used to bring foreign company, they get the contract, they get the job done, and then they're gone. And then that's why people was very skeptical of solar because if you see a solar project, you have at the end you have to maintain also because solar it's a product that you need to maintain and mm -hmm. at a certain certain point you need to change batteries, you need to change maybe bulb, you need to change so you need to bring that local content into those projects. That's why we've been very successful. What we did in three years, no company did it in 20 years. Mm. And Africa is changing politically as well, as we're yeah. seeing with uh, Mugabe in the news this morning, yeah. that he stepped down. What, what's it like navigating it politically very quickly? <coughs> Just give us an idea as a, as a business leader in Africa. Yeah, Africa is changing because uh, Africa is uh, young. It's a young continent. 65% uh, of the population is young versus Europe and most of the uh, Asian company like, uh, like Japan, uh, it's a young population. Uh, we are getting the critical mass. We are One billion today, in 30 years will be two billion, will be the most uh, populated continent. 
it's something that Africa should leverage because the critical mass will be there and now we are fighting to do, uh, open the borders because Africa used to be one. It's from the colonization, they decide to call this country uh, Senegal or Ivory Coast. You will find the same population cross-border. So we business people, we now uh, trying to get Africa together through the business mm -hmm. because we think the union of Africa will come from business, not political. That's why we uh, set up an organization called Afro Champion uh, last, uh, last month to bring successful business people in every country trying to come together so we mutualize our business so we can be a giant because uh, the, the critical mass is there. It's just if we go country by country, 10 million, 20 million people will not have the critical mass. So our government have to take regulation, a regulation to open uh, uh, the trans-border trans uh, trade and also regulation in tariff and all, most of uh, mutual, mutualization of our infrastructure. I give you an example. If you're doing a, 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 a railway, trans, we are talking about project of railway between Senegal to Djibouti. So uh, if we mutualize the railway project with a fiber optic project, you know the cost of uh, f uh, uh, civil engineering in a fiber optic project is 65% of the cost. So by mutualizing the, those infrastructure, you will reduce the cost. Africa is spending, f I think, 45 billion every year in infrastructure. So I think if we mutualize our different infrastructure, mm. the gap that we have today, we have a $50 billion gap of infrastructure in Africa. That gap will go on and also uh, the economy will be tied into, and then we'll have a bigger market. That's the future mm -hmm. of Africa. Absolutely, uh, infrastructure is important everywhere um, for, from what we've been hearing with the US and, and uh, China's One Belt, One Road initiative too. I wanna leave you guys to weigh in. I, I like what I'm hearing about the importance of people and, and customers, and you're talking about the, the local community having jobs, and and and, uh, and Richard, you've been talking about how, how people matter. It's not just technology. Um, I want all of you to weigh in on on social responsibility. I mean, we live in a transparent world now. Everything a company does, uh, you ca you can't just just throw something out there and say, "Hey, look, we're great." You've got to be consistently socially responsible. Um, do you think that should be an important part? each of you on, uh, well, well, yeah, sure, all of you will start with uh, Richard and uh, tell us, do you think that's an important part, a thing that companies need to really focus on going forward or is it something that you can put on the back burner? It's, it's something that you have to make an integral part of your business. When I came to CMS about 11 years ago, we were a company run for profit. Doesn't work. When you're a dominant player in a market, that gives you a privilege. With that privilege comes a, a major responsibility. So we've, so for instance, if our cement plant doesn't produce cement, there is no cement, okay? And that means the daily rated worker here will not be paid because there's no work for him to do. That means he has no money to buy rice, to put in his rice bowl for him and his kids. So we have a duty. So I have migrated CMS to a multi-stakeholder model. We do not run this company for profit, we run it for our staff, our suppliers, customers, we pay them on time, treat them fairly, our community, and also for our shareholders. And by doing those things, and as you heard in the previous session, the right way, you will make the right profit. And you must take a long-term view. And then you must also try and employ from your community. We run our businesses employing people from the community where that business happens, as much as we can. And they are part of our company. We talk about ourselves as a family our brothers and sisters. We don't talk about the bosses and whatever. We talk about the family. Our magazine's called Our CMS. They had an ESOS, they have a stake in it. So CSR, that's just something we do. You have a KPI for it, yeah, we do that. Makes people go out and plant mangroves or repair uh, churches, mosques, or teach in, in uh, orphanages, we do all that. But you've got to have that sense of values, the sense that you play a role in your community, that sense of purpose. 
That's what we talk about being socially responsible. You see, Samba comes from a different way. He wants to do things for the community. We don't seek to do that per se. We seek to do what we're instructed to do by the state, but to do it so everyone benefits socially and economically and fairly. Toby. And, and, I would, and I would say that we would like, probably fool ourselves if we could believe that we can continue fast growth economies if we are not inclusive in our growth. And that's actually being inclusive in looking at how do we not just reapply what worked somewhere else, what I call the shift and lift approach, right? And, like, and I think we recognize that as well in terms of the te payment technology that we would bring into markets like um, the emerging markets that leveraging QR codes or leveraging other types of interfaces. And I think that's really more with the recognition to say like, as you become included um, into the financial ecosystem, as you have access to being able to maybe get a small business loan, as you're being, being able to have accountable um, payment systems um, to you, I think you can really build businesses, you can grow your SME profiles, etc. And I think that is so important to us that it's not just about just trying to push and incentivize, but actually really think fundamentally about how do we build technology. And we do this in Africa with our lab in, in Nairobi where we build technology for farmers so they have better market information available to them so they can actually get a fair price, right? Because it's not just about them being able to produce more effectively and have good, uh, good uh, systems in place, but because they don't even know what's being paid at the world market, they can just be cheated by an agent. Uh, how do we think about time as a value, right? When we think about moms and dads paying for school children's education, and they have to travel and walk long distances to actually reach the schools, um, that's all opportunity costs that could be deployed in different, more productive ways, and how do we make them pay those things and make sure that the next generation is well-educated and gets the best opportunities. And then small business merchants, I think I talked about small loans, how do we help them be better connected to, to the suppliers, to MNCs that are often outsizing them by a factor um, of multiples or millions in some cases, and how do we make sure that it's um, a fair ecosystem where everybody has a right to play? And I think that's really what is a sustainable business model for us, because doing good um, is also allowing us to do well, and I think that will help us continue to grow as economies. Mm. And Samba, jump in here and tell us, is social responsibility something that you actively think of when you're embarking on a, a new business venture in Africa? Yes. Uh Whatever I'm doing today, uh, social responsibility is key. Uh, whatever is a project that uh, my company, uh, we are doing like into energy sector, into the infrastructure sector, it might be us or multinational. I give you an example. Um, uh, I structure financing for uh, many government in the big infrastructure project. What we used to see before is like uh, those can be European or Chinese company that coming in, bringing Chinese worker and so on and so on. So as soon as I start working with them, I told them if you want to stay for long, you need to involve local. I'll give you an example. Uh, Huawei, when they start a couple of years ago, those fiber optic project, they used to give contract to some Chinese uh, uh, company. But today, with my interaction with them, they give no subcontract to no Chinese company. It's forbidden by law. This is a discussion uh, I have with them, and I, I, I give them strategy, and they see it, because more you involve local people, mm. better the project are. So, so the focus is on, is on local jobs, and then yeah. if the talent isn't available locally, you can go externally. Let me ask you, I know that, that you're an expert on creative funding yeah. and financing for yeah. companies. Yeah. Let's say that um, China, for example, mm -hmm. provides a loan mm -hmm. for a deal. Mm -hmm. Are you then under pressure to give them more contracts? Is that expectation there? <clears throat> for people who know me, and all the projects I've been involved, it might be all kind of, Ch I work with uh, uh, top 10 Chinese companies, you can talk about China Triggers, who is the biggest uh, uh, hydro company in the world. Uh, my interaction with them bring them to understand more, because sometimes also, it's just a question of knowing. 
Because if you open a boulevard to somebody, they will take the boulevard. So it's up to us Africans to know what we want from them. Uh, I always tell them, we do business, it's true, but if you want to go stay on long term, make sure you give back to local because you're getting this wealth from them. In order to do inclusive growth, you need to have people on board. So that's what I did in hydro project, that's what I did in fiber optic project, that's what I did in power project. This is something that I do all the time. i give you another example. Uh, three years ago, I, I came into a joint venture with a French company who is the, now the leader in the world into ID and payment system. Um, you might know this company is called, uh, used to be uh, Oberto, now they, the company changed to IDMA when they buy out um, Morpho. So for the first time, when they have a discussion with me, they want to take me as an agent. They say, okay, uh, we want to do business in your country, we'll take you as an agent. Mm. I say, Africa changed. You cannot keep on. They said, no, for the past 30 years, we are doing like this, exactly. we are successful. I said, you want to do business in Africa? There's a new generation of African. You need to involve African. Oh, they said, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of investment involved. I said, whatever you invest, I will invest 50%. Right. So we start discussion, it takes eight months, but finally, they understand, they agree. Mm -hmm. We start this business, it's been successful, now they are using this as a model for African, for other African countries. So it's take us African to show the way. The business is in Africa, you want to do business in Africa, you have to involve African. Otherwise, it will stop one day. Mm -hmm. It's about being open to new business, but also having boundaries yes. and, and yeah. setting the rules. Okay, I, I want to get to something very practical now um, from each of you as business leaders. How, do you, how have your budgets changed over the past five years, and how do you divvy them up now? Um, do you spend more on IT? Or do you spend more on consumer experience? Um, how, are you, how are you breaking it up? Social responsibility, Richard? Um, we, have a, we don't have a particularly sort of... Our, our, our invest, investment really has gone into more capital equipment so we can meet growing demand in the state. That's where our money's gone. We have focused quite a lot of energy on what I call the customer relationship by moving from being a product vendor to a solution provider. Um, so we don't just sell you cement, we'll do the precast, we'll start making specialist cements. So we're trying to be a solution provider. So the spend on IT, ironically, is not that high partly because we have not really addressed it. I have to promise you that I've set my staff big KPIs for next year to, to develop their roadmap for the digital economy and how we're going to take advantage of it. But we've really focused on the fundamental. We're a developing state. We want to play a role in supporting that development. As Samba said, we don't want foreigners to be doing it. We want Sarawakian companies, Sarawakian people, and our state partners to be doing that work and to be providing those materials, resources, construction services, we want it done locally. Um, you know, we're proud, we have two and a half thousand people and about 35, it's about 25, 30 non-Sarawakians, almost all of which are specialist engineers and about 20 of them are from Malaysia. If you're a Malaysian, you're an expat here, by the way. So, so Richard, um, but what, what about the budget? Are, are, have, have, has your budget okay. shifted? In, in recent years? No, it's still, still the same, capex. 100%. So you have the same division. So. Yep, we're still growing. We're still investing in the things to grow our business to meet the needs of the state. Now, in terms of CSR and doing those activities, that always grows. Mm. We have regular commitments each year, and that grows steadily each year in line with our profits. Right. But our focus is not on giving money, but on giving time, skills, and resources. That's where we try and go. We all give money. Of course we do. But if you any of you come to me requesting 200,000 ringgit for your charity, you won't get it. But if 10 of you come for five to 10,000 ringgit for a small community charity, you're sure to get it. <laughs> we like supporting small charities, small communities, that really where we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. So Toby, give us your view. So that's the view from a traditional um, industry and a conglomerate. The view from, from finance, technology, CX? Well, I, I think there's always gonna be um, the transformation budgets that we have, but I think in the end of the day, you should think about it like a startup. 
because you look, the entry barriers are really low these days. So when you're an entrepreneur and you want to start a digital company and get your business license, get on, get on the cloud network, etc., that doesn't cost actually a lot of money. So I think what we've really carved out is a culture of experiments to make sure that we have a lab, or this is the part that I represent of MasterCard, where you are able to future-proof your business by doing a lot of high, highly repeatable, quick experiments to make sure that you have the right building blocks from a digital economy standpoint ready to go when they start scaling, and then you kick them over and start um, industrializing them. So I think that's basically, the, I think, the mindset shift that I see in terms of budgets where there's more investment going into smaller scale in sandbox and smaller scale experiments that um, actually basically future proof and then make sure that your core still is able to transform itself over time. So the industrial, uh, industrial um, scale comes a bit later. And we always think about it as risk. So how do you assess all your projects based on risk? And we do that by just looking at how many assumptions do you have, how much knowledge do you have about what really happened from a consumer lens, from a technical feasibility lens, and from a commercialization lens. And that's, uh, I think that's really how we manage the budget, so it's very opportunistic, but we give ourselves the same benchmark as a startup, to say like it doesn't need to cost $100 million, $900 million to do something. Like you can start with $5,000, and actually even in an organization as large as MasterCard, we can get a commercial product up and going with $5,000. Mm, okay, and Samba, budget advice. How do you break it up? Uh, in terms of uh, energy, for me, disruptiveness has to be involved also with your local reality. Um, we start energy, solar energy project into areas. So one thing that we see so far, energy is good. You bring energy to an area, it's good. But in order to make it sustainable, you need to think about how energy can be the baseline and to improve other activities. This is where we are going forward now. We have a new project that we call Smart Solar Ecosystem. The Smart Solar Ecosystem aim is to bring energy and then with the energy, we bring government service, it's a payment, ID, because from my also my other activities of, active, uh, of payment. And also we bring a telecom tower so the energy can power the tower because you see Africa have hundreds of thousands of uh, telco towers. So with this tower, we will bring internet service to the communities. We will bring bandwidth telecom services. So uh, those companies will pay high cost so that money will subsidize the, the villager. So you have uh, the telco tower, you have the government services where people will come and do pay tax, they will come for ID, they will come for payment of bills. So you will have agriculture service, we'll put an agro service center where agriculture uh, farmer will come. They get trained, they can do rental, they can do all kind of uh, uh, payment system. Also, when they bring their crop, we link that to a bank. We are negotiating with a big bank that MasterCard is also working with, with the new cure system. Mm -hmm. uh, a few days ago, I, I have a meeting with this, uh, the CEO of this bank who is in 33 country. I won't name the, the company, but you know who I'm talking about. So the whole idea is to bring uh, energy and service to the last mile because for us, this will be the disruptive for Africa, mm -hmm. because the service cannot just be in a big city. We have to bring it to the last mile. Absolutely. We have also uh, uh, a partnership with a French company that bring a medical checkup to the last mile. Mm -hmm. It can go on motorbike. They, in every 15 minutes, you could do checkup of uh, the population, and then whenever you have a connection, that will go on the cloud. So we will create what we call digital health record for all the population. Mm. Um, we want to throw it open to the audience now. We've got a nice um, intimate group here, fairly cozy room. So if anyone has a question, we've got uh, three microphones spaced out 
across the front of the room. So please feel free to just put up your hand. We'll get a microphone over to you or come up to one of the mics and just wave and let me know if you have a question and we'll get to you. Uh, and you can put it directly to whichever panelist you want. So it'd be lovely to have your participation today as well. Uh, any questions? Anyone want to put up their hand? Questions from anywhere in this group? Hard to see you out through all the lights. Okay, if you do, just come up to the front and uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. So guys, um, I want to get get a sense from you on um, how many restrictions you have when it comes to executing your, your executive visions. Do you think private companies have more flexibility in this, this new environment than public companies? Is that an advantage? And, and also corporate culture. I mean, how do you cope with that? Richard. Uh, private companies, in a way, have an advantage because you're not responsible for quarterly results. Quarterly results, analysts, investment community comments, you know, it can make you have a short-term focus. So one way of hopefully getting around that is to persuade your board and your key shareholders that you must have a long-term plan and that you must be allowed to execute it. You have to show deliverables. It has to be something they can see happening. But you, and, that why, and that also gives actually a lot of opportunities for Asian companies. Many Asian companies have a founding family or founding institution there, whether it's PNB, or a family or whatever. And they hopefully will provide that stability to allow a progressive CEO to have that long-term plan. So you don't have to take the short-term view that we constantly see in Western listed companies, which I find quite depressing. Toby. Well, yeah, I, th I think when we really look at the long-term, short-term plan, I think I already talked about experiments, but I think it's really, we always say like execution is key, right? Like I think we, I think it's a, a pivot in terms of how we look at our employee uh, f makeup, in term, like how um, many engineers do we need to have to be ready for the digital economy. So it's just something we chisel away on every single year. Um, and it is, um, it is the relentlessness of the ecosystem that we're in, in terms of fintech, banks, everybody. Um, you, you keep hearing like value exchange and, and systems and we have the big fintech giants out of China that are coming into the markets. Um, all of them ultimately fighting for the eye of the customer, the eye of the corporate. So the relentlessness, I think, is, is there, um, but it's a transformation of people, it's a transformation of mindset. And um, it's a, like I always say, it's a, you have optimism and pessimism built into the system because you have to make sure everything you do has commercial commerciality, materiality, it's not about toys. So when we think about the way we, um, we do things, i just give an example. Like, so I work on robots humanoid robots for customer service. And you may make you saying like, well, how is that commercially relevant? Because it's a little robot, it's a toy. But what we actually do is like, you start with a project like that, you understand the bigger picture, which actually is the voice interface that we talked about. So how smart speakers like Amazon Echo, Google Home, uh, Siri, um, all of these things are suddenly exploding all around us. But because of that robot, we have that skill ready to go. So that's the way to think about start small, dream big, move fast. And I think that's really, I think, the mindset to execute very strong innovation that is ready to go when it's actually ready to bloom. Right. And still be accountable to shareholders at the same time. So Samba, you're, you're leading some very young companies. Um, what do you think when someone says IPO? IPO for me is, uh, I think, um, is the next step because um, whatever we're doing, we are growing so fast. Uh, we're going country to country. Um, we want to make sure all the business are sustainable. Mm. And then the next thing will be IPO because we have a, a young continent and there's a, there's a lot of growth uh, for the future. In Africa, as I was telling you, we are a billion, and you know ev everything in, in Africa is starting, it's new. But, so but there's, you, a, there's a room. Do there's you worry it's going to limit you as as an executive, as a business leader, uh, because of the accountability, the reporting? And we'll get the microphone a little bit closer to you. Thank no, you. it's uh, for for me. It will uh, it will help enhance. One thing we don't have in Africa, it's uh, those public funding. Whatever you make money is the money that you, you have, you will reuse to invest. Uh, I give you an example. There is a company that I met two years ago. Uh, they do solar street light like us. Uh, 
They only sell, in the past four years, less than 5,000 streetlights. And the market value is $40 million. So through our discussion, she find out, it's a lady, she find out that uh, we sold more than 100,000 streetlights in Africa in less than three years. So she told me, if she was me, her company will worth a billion. So just to, to show you that uh, this is something that is missing in Africa, right. but is coming together, I think is the, is the future. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time. I want to ask you guys, um, first of all, any questions from the floor? Mm -hmm. We're all feeling a little bit tired now and ready for lunch. Oh, we have a question from a gentleman down here. Good afternoon, distinguished speakers. Uh, my question direct to Dr. Richard. How do you see or what's your opinion on the role of uh, government-linked companies, for example? Because I can see uh, in, in reality, or rather it's a, a mystery, that back in Pen Peninsular Malaysia, that there are government-linked companies that are uh, involved or playing in the same playing field of the SMEs, right? This, this, so uh, is this befitting of the role of the GLCs or... Uh, sometimes it may not be the proper GLCs, but, but they came up with uh, uh, subsidiaries, or you know, and then they are playing in the same playing field of the SMEs. So, is this a disruptive or is this a, uh, helping the industry? Well, it's um, a difficult question to answer. My view is that GLCs have a role to play in Malaysia because the government needs to help drive the economy. One of Malaysia's successes, I think, is attributable to the fact we have a a strong private sector, but there is a steering force from the government to make sure it stays on track, makes the right long-term investment decisions. Okay, there's another side to it which where it doesn't always work, and that comes into the SMEs. They must not crowd out the SMEs. But I do see voices in the government, moves by the government to encourage the SMEs. Because look, a big company hires 20 people, but an SME it's much easier to grow, the exponential growth, to hire from five to 10 to 20. It's much easier than a big company. So I want them to free the SMEs and to encourage them, provide them the platform. And to that extent, the GLCs have to step back. And we have to focus on wealth generation for all communities. Anyone who's disadvantaged must get help. And that's why the educational system has moved. That's why the HOTS training you're having in schools is very important. This vocational training we're talking about, the, the Meister program they're doing in Penang. We've got to get the right education so the SMEs, economic opportunities can be available for everybody at all levels. And you're right, government must step back from it. Thank you so much for your question. We are almost out of time, so what I want to do for the remaining few minutes is I want to put these guys on the spot, and I'm going to ask them a series of questions, and they have to answer each question in 10 seconds or less. And what we're trying to do is give you some short answers to help you map out your business strategies over the next five to 10 years. So uh, first question to you, Samba, 10 seconds or less, what kind of leadership style is going to do the best in the next 10 years? The leadership in the business or on the leadership politics? in business. What type of CEO? What type of executive is going to really excel in this this new business environment we're dealing with? Uh, the CEO who are more social conscious, like uh, social entrepreneurship. As far Africa is concerned, social entrepreneurship will be the key. Mm, okay, Toby. Well, I think um, really the CEO that actually embraces. Uh, transformation and it's also around in, in driving creativity into uh, the organization. So when we think about future skills of people and as a CEO, you are the, ma like the key lead of those future skills. Okay, Richard. Simple courage, vision, and get an engaged workforce. You heard about it early, you cannot do anything if you don't have the people working with you. That's the key. Okay. Does age matter when it comes to the CEO of a company? Is a younger leader more equipped to deal with the new business environment? Samba. I think for new business, having a, a young brain, it, it helps because you are more active. And we see that you take all these top 10 uh, tech company, mm. uh, most of them today 
uh, young people, you take Google, uh, Google you take uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. that's because they have more time, they are more They're creative. They're babies. <laughs> so, uh, Toby. People. Oh, sorry. Well, so we'll move okay. down, Toby. Okay. Um, no, I don't think age matters. I think it goes back to the vision that Richard was saying because it's not so much a, a CEO that basically thinks about what they can do better will always be the better CEO than the one that thinks about how we can preserve the status quo. Okay, Richard, is it youth or is it experience that matters the most? You need both. You can't, nothing's exclusive. Just you need both. If you are old and you can't get Instagram and Twitter, get someone to show you open a Twitter account, be like the US president, then you can be part of it all. You've got to join that system, that world, otherwise you'll be out of touch. That means I've got to open a Facebook page. <laughs> but you know, we have to do it. You can can't divorce friend. yourself. You can all be like Donald Trump. You can be tweeting every morning and getting your <laughs> messages out there. Samba, single biggest thing you worry about? Uh, the single thing I'm, I'm worried about is the um, lack of leadership into uh, political leaders, mm -hmm. especially in, in Africa. Uh, I think uh, the, f the fight of the next generation of uh, African is to have good leadership. Mm -hmm. Leadership that are patriots, that love their country, and uh, leadership also into business because um, what we have seen before, uh, people make business, people, they make money in Africa, okay. they bank outside of Africa, they spend money out of Africa, mm -hmm. so they will go f for healthcare in, out of, outside of Africa, okay. they will do shopping out of South Africa, they will go vacation out of South Africa. How can you <laughs> keep wealth in Africa if you don't I spend need a buzzer. money? I need a buzzer if for you don't seconds, spend right? money into <laughs> Africa. So for me, that will be key. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Samba. And it's a great point because democracy is really starting to emerge in Africa and that's gonna make a difference for business. Toby, single biggest thing that you worry about? Lack of interoperability, because I think as we think about our own economies, we sometimes have the short-term vision of saying like, let's keep something quick and dirty and closed loop. Um, but I think ultimately for all of us globally to prosper, I think it's how do we better cooperate and create increased levels of interoperability. Mm -hmm. Okay, Richard. I, I agree with Samba. It's a political landscape that worries us. Fortunately, not so much in Sarawak, but it is a big issue. And the world needs a better caliber of political leadership to, to deal with this world. All right. Um, biggest opportunity that you think business, investment community, business leaders, that they're missing right now? What's the biggest opportunity that, that you guys see on your horizon? What can you tell us, Samba? The big opportunity that I see in Africa, it's everything have to be done. That's, there's opportunity all over Africa. I've been traveling for Africa for the past 20 years, more than 40 years. Every country that I go, I see opportunity. Sometimes mm -hmm. I don't know where to start. There's opportunity where, everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. That's something Frontier that uh, you see every day opportunity. Business is coming to you every day. You see what you can do if there is a, a good structuring. So yeah. there's opportunity everywhere it's in Africa. Everywhere. So no one specific opportunity. Toby. I always say like whenever you touch paper, there's opportunity for innovation. May it be cash contracts, invoices, like government documents. And so that is really kind of like a really easy way to focus on where is the next big thing. Oh, love that. Medical records, another big area that, that's growing in that yeah. way. Richard. Um, it, within Srawak, industrialization. We've got the energy, we, we need the infrastructure that's coming. That's enormous potential, for the industrialization of our state. But the thing I also dream we should be doing, which I shall never be able to do, is agriculture. I think we become an enormous food growing and processing state. We've got the land and I really pray our leadership will get into that and so will our people. I know it's not an easy business, but I think it's something really valuable for Sarawak to add as another asset into its portfolio of economies. And remember, we are just like what Samba said. He talks about the opportunities everywhere in Africa. Sarawak is Malaysia's frontier market. We've got every opportunity all over the place. We just have to take advantage of it professionally and systematically. 
Yeah, I, I was shocked flying in at how serene and unpopulated all the coastlines are. So much opportunity here, you can just see it. Okay, final question for our panelists uh, for this session. And I just want to ask you, what's your final piece of advice from each of you that you would like to leave these folks with today? Samba. My advice for which field? General? Uh, my advice for the, um, in the general is the world to come together to have uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, the wealth because uh, if we want to have uh, uh, security in the world because it's a question of uh, world security to, to spread the wealth. The wealth. Uh, wherever there is a uh, wrong distribution of wealth, there is problem. So whatever we're doing is to share uh, the wealth, is to share uh, the, the growth, and um, that will take to uh, uh, world peace and security. That's the base of everything that we, we want to do. Especially when I, we're talking about Africa, mm -hmm. I say we need to have inclusive growth uh, it's a question of uh, national security. I love that. I love that coming from a business leader from Africa. Keep your balance. I think that deserves a round of applause, actually. Mm -hmm. Share the wealth. Mm -hmm. It's not just the 1%. Business is all about the collective good. Toby. So when you think about technology, don't think about whether or not you're too early or too late. Just make it adopt to today. <laughs> Get with it, is what he's saying, basically. Big round of applause for Toby. And the last word today goes to Dato Richard, who, by the way, he's turning 66 on Monday, and at the end of the year, he's gonna be retiring as uh, the CEO. He's gonna be staying on the board of directors, so he keeps pointing that out. He's not retiring, he's still gonna be around. Um, so last word to you, Richard, after uh, an illustrious career here in, in Malaysia. What's your advice to these okay. folks? Firstly, I have to say I 100% agree with Samba. This need for income equality, equal opportunity, inclusiveness is fundamental for the future of societies across the world. It is fundamental. If we as leaders do not address that, our world's going to fall apart. It's fundamental and we don't realize how important it is. The last thing I want to leave you with is something I believe describes the economic world we live in and where it's going. It's an American military concept called VUCA, V-U-C-A. Any of my staff here will groan to hear it again. Okay, it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That is the world, in w the way in which you fight a war. That's what it is. You have the fog of war, you fight a war on imperfect information. And that's our world now. There's no single strategy, there's no single easy answer. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. You can Google it. This is not my original thought, but it's something I think is terribly relevant. So how do you deal with that as a company? Be agile, have a sense of purpose, and do the right thing the right way, and then you've got a very good chance of succeeding in this VUCA world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Let's give them a big round of applause, our panel today. And good luck to all of you out there uh, as you plot your business course over the next five to 10 years. We hope this has been helpful. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Interesting indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, another big round of applause for the panelists, our distinguished panelists, and also our gorgeous moderator. May we invite our panelists and our gorgeous moderator for a group photo? And yes, uh, thank you very much to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for now, we take a break. You are all invited for lunch. And next, the panel discussion will be at 2.30 p.m., so looking forward to see you later, so please enjoy your lunch. And once again, thank you very much for joining us, and don't forget, at 2 p.m., also we have the Mocha Soundscape, all right? So please be here and join us. Thank you very much once again. <laughs>